Uh, I just wanted to say by way of introduction that uh, you're all here because this has become an issue of public interest uh, following government approvals of the large Santos and BG projects in the Surat Basin. And we're now seeing being considered in parallel a range of proposals for coal seam gas extraction, for a huge open cut coal mine, for a proposed coal liquids project, and for a proposed underground coal gasification project. And these all raise significant environmental issues. And uh, the reason for holding this public forum is to get a chance to uh, air those issues and uh, put on notice those who are responsible for doing the uh, due diligence on our behalf. So let me, without further ado, introduce our four speakers. The first is Dr. John Stanley, OAM, formerly of the Department of Natural Resources and Mines, and he's going to talk about the challenge of agriculture and mining. Please make him welcome. Having been to the World Congress of Soil Science recently, um, Dr. Colin Chartres pointed out the extent to which we're losing fresh water from aquifers and reserves around the world for both agriculture and also for um, urban populations. And then Professor Julian Cribb um, also wrote this book, which has just come out, called The Coming Famine, pointing out the extent to which we are losing agricultural land around the world, and yet world population is going to increase, we believe, to about 9 billion or more. So given that perspective, you'll understand why I feel passionately we must do our best to save this agricultural land and decide the best areas for mining and the most suitable areas to be retained for agriculture. Having said that, this is the Pelton area. Can you imagine that beautiful Pelton Valley there? Now the plan is for Amber Energy to mine further upslope, but also in this catchment, if you mine further upslope, then you also um, mine the intake areas for rainfall um, for the aquifers. So um, Robert Reed will mention more about this area later on, but this is the alternative for uh, and that Pelton site, a, a big mining project instead. I could go into this in more detail. But then we talk about the vertisol soils of the Darling Downs and the Liverpool Plains. This is an example of the rich, deep, cracking clay soil, 1.6 metres deep, excellent water holding capacity, some of the best country in Australia for agricultural production. And nearby, of course, you hear about Brigolo clay soils. These also have very deep profiles, excellent for growing crops right across central Queensland and southern Queensland. Again, very special areas. Then comes the question, if you do mine, what about rehabilitation? Well, this particular um, graph here gives you an idea that the nutrients are mostly concentrated very close to the topsoil. The high concentration of phosphorus close to the surface, and at 20 to 40 centimetres, then you see a much lower concentration. If you don't, return those soil layers in the correct order, you've lost that initial soil fertility from the topsoil. Furthermore, we consider the Brigolo clay soils, many of these have salt at depth. So this is the site at Capone where you saw that beautiful wheat crop. Hardly any sodium in the surface. They go down to 60 centimetres and the ESP is about 27 and the marginal value for ESP is considered to be 6. In which case, if that subsoil becomes a topsoil, this generates <coughs> a saline site, a sodic site, a bit more value for agriculture. So, one of the consequences of using saline or coal seam gas water, which is high in salt, for um, landscapes is that you can end up with <coughs> landscapes like this. This is an area that's been affected by water of the equivalent concentration of salts as coal seam gas. <coughs> water. That's another alternative. The salt may end up on the surface and you lose the crop, um, creating more big problems. I'll then come back to the question of farmers trying to work with coal seam gas networks. Can you imagine trying to manage this property 
with this network of coal seam gas pipes and wells, uh, trying to move irrigation equipment, trying to move stock, and so on and so forth. Now, at the moment, I believe there are 4,000 wells already in place for coal seam gas extraction, and they're talking of 40,000. So I just actually consider the consequences of this to the farming community for trying to manage those properties with such an incredible network of pipes. So having said that, I briefly wanted to emphasise to you, first of all, that saving agricultural land is vital, both for food security and for water security for this country. Secondly, about the impacts of coal seam and gas water that they could have on the landscapes. Then there's a question of the disposal of salt. There's talk of up to 200 tonnes of salt per day coming up with the coal seam and gas water. And we have yet to work out what we're going to do with that salt. And there's one calculation that over 30 years you could end up with 1.6 million tonnes of salt, which requires suitable disposal. And I believe that could carry irreparable damage in the future. And then there's the question, of course, of the farmers of trying to manage properties with coal seam gas networks. So I'll leave those thoughts with you, ladies and gentlemen. I believe the other speakers will elaborate on them. Thank you.